Several years ago, uh, many of you know this about uh, my story. Uh, if you don't, we were in the uh, um, direct zone where Hurricane Katrina hit, and um, we were pastoring a church at that time about two miles from the Gulf of Mexico, and Hurricane Katrina came and just blew everything up. And we were going seven days a week trying to recover you know, from, from all of this. And it was tough. It was a difficult time. Well, one night I had a dream. And uh, I was, I, I'm one of those people, I, I sleep people tell us that we dream every night, you know, and I guess that's true. I just don't remember 99% of them. You know, I don't know, I'm, I'm out. I, I'm not thinking about what I'm dreaming or don't even remember it. But this particular time I did, I had this dream that I was out with some friends or people that I was really well acquainted with. We were hanging out like at a restaurant and I, it was on the beach, and so I went walking down the beach. I don't know where I was going. I was just kind of hanging out by myself and he, heading away. And I passed this. It's a dream. Did you hear that part? Okay, just before I say this, you don't think I'm crazy. I passed this half horse, half woman thing on the beach. And as I passed, she was ta- like she caught my attention and said something. And I was like, well, hey, you know, this is, this is weird. And we were sort of talking, but I had this weird feeling. You know how when you meet someone, like a stranger the first time, but you get this weird feeling in your gut, like something's not right? I had that feeling, but I didn't know what it was. So I just kind of like, okay, whatever, you know, I was kind of walking away. And I walked down the beach, and just so happens there was this, you know, Manhattan-style skyscraper, you know, at the end of the beach. It's a dream, right? So I got in there, and I'm kind of walking through the, the marble foyer. It's this long, big foyer. And I'm walking in there, and I see some friends so kind of wave, and I'm going by. And then all of a sudden, the horsewoman comes. And I'm thinking, oh, no, she's chasing me. Like, she's after me. So I take off running, and I jump into an elevator. You know, you're always trying to get in a car. It won't go. You know how dreams are. So I was going to jump in an elevator, and, I'm in the, and all of a sudden, I hear the horse hoofs on the marble floor. Ka-clop, ka-clop, ka-clop. Now she's running. I went, oh, no. She's running after me. She's like full, clock, clock, clock. She's coming. Here she comes. And I get a little bit, and I'm pushing the button, and I'm pushing the button, and I'm pushing the button. I'm like, door closed, 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 closed. I just want to go up the elevator. It's all I know. And I'm pushing the button as hard as I can, and all of a sudden, I feel something grab my hand. I went, oh, wait, she got me. That's it. It's too late. She got me. You know in dreams how you're always supposed to wake up before that happens? I did not. She got me. She grabbed my hand. And then I was jolted awake by our, at the time, about six-year-old son who had come into our bedroom and awake in the middle of the night and was pulling my arm going, Dad, wake up. Dad, wake up. Dad, wake up. And I'm just going to tell you, never have I ever been electrically shocked out of sleep like in that moment at the same moment I was dreaming that horsewoman had grabbed my hand and was pulling me out of the elevator, my six-year-old was pulling me out of bed, and I woke up in a panic. I mean, it literally fried my brain. Now, you're wondering, did we have to come all the way to church to hear this? Why, why would you say this? Well, I was telling someone the next day, we had a bunch of different churches who came to our church. They would send people, work teams. And I thought it was funny because I thought, man, I got shocked, scared out of my brain last night in the middle of sleep. It was hard to go back to sleep after that. And I was telling him the dream, and he said, you know, I I didn't know him. I don't know. I just thought it was funny. I was telling everybody because I thought it was funny. And he said, "Um, you know, sometimes the Lord helps me to understand what a dream means. Do Do you mind if I tell you what I think your dream means? And I thought, I wasn't even on that wavelength. You know, I'm, I'm looking out the window, and we got like 400 pallets of water and car. You know, I'm in a disaster zone. And I said, yes, that would be great. You know, I'll take any meaning I can get at this point. And he said, I think in your dream, the horsewoman represents the church, who is a, a mysterious and beautiful thing, but has begun to overwhelm you, and you feel like you can't get away from her. And I think you need rest. I think you need to back away from what you're doing. You need rest. And I said, ooh, I think you're right. I think I need rest. I think I've become overwhelmed in this disaster recover, and I think I need a break. And so in about the mid-90s, this was like 10 years before that, I remember the first time I came on this property when this building was being built. This whole wing over here hadn't even been started yet. Just the daycare part, the footers for the daycare was being built. 
And I remember when I stepped on this property, I won't say that it was a vision like I saw something, but it was such a profound experience, I could describe it as a vision. I remember when I stepped on this property, I was like 20, 20 something, very young and just started ministry. And I remember in that moment, the Lord just surrounded me with this thought that overwhelmed me. I mean, it literally overwhelmed me. The Lord spoke to me and said, one day I want you to pastor this church. And I thought, it's not even here yet. <laughs> it's, not even, it's not even built. It's not even, and I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm like 20 whatever. I've never pastored any church. Why would you say that to me? And that was in like the mid-90s. And then in 2009, um, we moved here and began to pastor. So here's, what am, what am I saying to you today? What I'm saying to you today is, is the Lord speaks through dreams and visions. That's what I'm saying. Now, you, you may think, well, that's an that's a odd or a weird thing. But let me just kind of build my case for a minute here, okay? Why does God speak through dreams and visions? So, when God created the Garden of Eden... He put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and heaven and earth were one thing. Okay? The heavenly realm and the earthly realm was one thing. It was perfectly unified. And there was no sin, and there was no sickness, and there was no disease, and there was no evil, and there was no corruption, and there were no politics. <laughs> hey, maybe that's heaven. And, and there, were, there were no revenge, and there was none of these things. And then the Bible tells us when Jesus returns, one of the things that he's going to do is he's going to realign heaven and earth. They're going to become one thing again. And there'll be perfect unity between them and there'll be no separation. The problem is you and I live in between those two times. We're not in the Garden of Eden before sin entered the world. And we're not when Jesus has come back when heaven and earth are going to be one thing again. We're in the middle where heaven and earth are misaligned. But what happens while we're on earth is heaven and the kingdom of God are breaking in. They're invading earth. They're, we get little glimpses, little, little thoughts, little pockets, little things. And one of the things that God uses to help us understand that breaking in our dreams and visions. So in this series we've called the Apocalypse, A New Perspective, we said last week what an apocalypse is. Apocalypse means to uncover, it means to reveal, it means to make visible. So what God does when, when an apocalypse happens, you know, we think it's zombies or the end of the world or all that, but what an apocalypse is in the Bible is it's when God pulls the curtain back and we're able to see things we couldn't see before. We're able to see heaven when all we've been looking at is earth. We're able to see that there's more to this world than just what's in front of us. And so when God gives you an apocalypse, and one of the ways he does that is in dreams. So um, we see this in, um, in 2 Kings chapter 6, okay? The king of Aram is trying to capture Israel. And every time he gets intel about where Israel is, he moves his army down to capture Israel, and every time he gets there, Israel's gone. They do the exact perfect thing that they needed to do to escape, and they're gone again. And king of Aram, out of frustration, says, okay, somebody in my inner cabinet here is a spy, and they're telling the king of Israel every time what we're about to do. That's why he keeps getting away. And one of his soldiers says, no, no, that's not what it is. There's no spies here. I'll tell you who it is. It's Elisha. Elisha was a prophet in Israel, and he said, Elisha tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. So the king of Aram didn't disbelieve that. He believed that this prophet had the ability to do that, but he said, who's Elisha? Where's he at? Let's go get him. So the king of Aram amassed this army, this military force, with chariots and soldiers and horses and all of that. And he finds the city where Elisha is. He surrounds the city at night. So when the sun comes up, they're like, uh-oh. You know, when the sun went down, we were good. The sun came up, we are not good. And here's, here's what happened, 2 Kings 6. The servant of the man of God, the servant of Elisha, got up and went out early the next morning, and an army with horses and chariots has surrounded the city. Oh, no, my Lord, what shall we do, the servant asked. This is a good time to panic, right? It's the best time to panic right here. 
Elijah says, don't be afraid. <laughs> I can't think of a better time to be afraid than when an army has surrounded the city that you're in and they're looking for you. I can't think of a better time to be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So the servant says, have you looked out the window? In here, it's us. Out there, it's them. They've got horses, and they've got soldiers, and they've got, they've got chariots. We got sticks and soup. We got nothing. What are you talking about? Greater of them who are with us than those who are out there. But he could see in the earthly dimension, but he couldn't see in the heavenly dimension. Look at verse 17. The very next thing, Elisha prayed. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes. The Lord apocalypsed him. The Lord pulled the curtain back. Watch. And he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire. I'll see your horses and chariots, and I'll raise you horses of chariots and fire. <laughs> you see? Mine are better than yours. And there's more of them. And he looked and the hills were full of horses and chariots for all around Elisha. The servant got an apocalypse. The curtain was pulled back and now he's not just looking at the way things are on earth. He's looking at this other dimension and the way things are in the heavenly realm. I, I, I have a, a pastor friend who tells a story about a Jewish man that he knew who... Uh, found Jesus. Now, a traditional Jew doesn't believe that Jesus was God. Jesus was just a good prophet. But this man found Jesus, became a follower of Jesus, gave his life to Jesus, and his family, as you might imagine, wasn't happy with that and gave him a lot of flack. One day, this man was riding in a car and he looked out in a field and he saw an angel holding a sword with a flame on it and the angel said to him, don't be afraid, I'll fight this battle for you. Now what is that? Is that just people making stuff up? Or has God pulled the curtain back and said, you're not alone. You're not fighting this battle by yourself. There's another dimension here that you can't see. Now look, dreams are one way God pulls the curtain back and I'm not saying that all dreams are God talking to you I would probably go as far to say most dreams are not God talking to you sometimes it's stress sometimes it's fear sometimes it's insomnia sometimes it's the pizza you ate at midnight right sometimes it's because you're not treating your body right sometimes it's a whole host of things sometimes it's your imagination but you know what sometimes it's God Sometimes it's an apocalypse. Sometimes it's God pulling the curtain back and letting you see in another dimension. The Bible is filled with dreams and visions. Why would we think that those stopped? Acts chapter 2, 17 says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Why would you think that... that when do you think that starts? Well, if you look at Jesus' birth, Jesus' birth is surrounded by dreams and visions. Joseph didn't divorce Mary because God spoke to him in a dream. Joseph and Mary take baby Jesus and avoid Herod who's trying to kill him because of a dream. Pilate's wife, who wasn't even a believer, had a God spoke to her in a dream. Can God speak to people who don't even believe in Jesus in dreams? Yes. Yes, he can. I wouldn't say all dreams are that, but he can. If you include visions, angels appear to Mary. Angels appear to uh, Zechariah, John's father. Visions and dreams appear throughout the Old Testament. Now think about it for a minute. Maybe one of the reasons God speaks to us in dreams is because you and I have this ability to suppress the kingdom of heaven and suppress the kingdom of God because we get in our routine, we get in our grind, we live so deep in earth 
that we consciously and unconsciously suppress the eternity that's coming. And maybe one of the reasons God speaks to us in dreams, it's the one time we're quiet. And we're not moving. And we're receptive. And we're open. <laughs> and maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons God speaks to us there. In November of 2017, I stood on this stage with about 50 people. And I asked them a question. Would you spend the next two years of your life helping us to discern what God's vision is for Kingwood Church? November of 2017. Almost all of them said yes. And we spent all of 2018 and all of 2019 praying and talking and discerning and saying, God, help us to know what your vision is for this church. And in February of 2020, we brought that vision to you and said, this is what we believe God has showed us that he wants to do in this church and through this church in this community. And 15 days later, COVID-19 hit. 15 days. Now, I, now, it depends on, you can look at that two ways. You can go, oh no, we just got started. Or you can say how wise God is that he planned this out and he gave us crystal clarity at a time where nothing was going to be certain. And that's what God did. He gave us 15 days. We completed a two and a half year process 15 days before COVID-19 hit. Before we started shutting everything down. And we had the benefit of having vision and clarity. And I don't think that's a coincidence. So God's vision for our church is also partly God's vision for my life and your life and our family. If you're part of Kingwood family, that's God's vision for you too. So what I want to do this morning is just quickly give you an update on what that apocalypse is that God gave to Kingwood Church. Here's what it is. God wants this church to be a movement of hope in Shelby County and beyond. Now, now why? Why, why a movement? Because God wants to mobilize the believers in this body to impact this community and then the whole world. That's what our vision, that's the vision he gave us. Now, how, how will we do that? Four ways. Number one, and I'm, what I'm going to do is show you how we've been w moving through this vision, this apocalypse, for the last several months. Number one, helping people meet God. So one of the reasons that we jumped on as soon as COVID hit and started doing daily devotions online is because we believe that what God wants this church to do is to help people meet God. Like the, like the most, look, without God, there's no hope, right? And so you got to meet him, and you got to meet him again, and you got to meet him again, and you got to meet him again. You meet him in the morning when you do devotions. You meet him on Sunday when you come and pray and worship. You meet him when you meet with a group of believers and discuss. You meet him, meet him. And so we did online devotions every day for weeks. And then, then look, we went from a church who had never had an online ministry on March 15th to the next Sunday only had an online ministry. <laughs> That's all we had. And it was not good. <laughs> Can I just say that? It was not. It was online. Please don't go back and search it. It was not that good. But you know why we did it? And you have no idea how much work it took to get there. But you know why we did it? Because we said, God has apocalypsed us. He has revealed to us what our purpose is, and we will live or die in it. We are going online because just because COVID-19 struck doesn't mean people got to stop meeting God. People got to meet God maybe more now than ever. And so, and so we pushed to go online. And then we said, we got to have prayer. How do people meet God? One of the best ways to pray. So that's why we have an online prayer team this morning. That's why we've had an online prayer team the whole time. And then, and then we started uh, after service, uh, near the end of service today, if you're here in person, we'll have a prayer team here with masks on and everything, and we work very hard to provide a safe way for you to have prayer. Because it's important that people meet God. You know what? You can't even come on our campus and serve anywhere. We have dozens and dozens and dozens, probably 100 people are more serving today, and you can't even come on our campus and serve anymore without getting prayed for. This morning when I came in, came in and did my check-in, a little team of people surrounded me, and they stretched their hands over me, and they said, God, today, bless our pastor. 
and help him and help him to say what you've given him to say and help and you know what it just it just I met God for a minute you know what I need to meet God too and God's vision for our church is that we help people meet God number two that we we help people find purpose so God's given you strengths and he's given you gifts and I can tell you this you'll never be fully satisfied until you use the strengths that he's given you for his eternal purposes. There's not enough vacations, there's not enough holidays, there's not enough hobbies, there's not enough things, toys you can buy or homes you can acquire, there's not enough experiences you can have, there's not enough adventures you can go on, there's not enough money you can accumulate, there's there's not enough friends that you can have. Oh, it will distract you for a little while, but you'll eventually come back around to the same place and say, something is missing in my life. And you know why? You were created to make an eternal difference. And when you're not making an eternal difference, you're not satisfied. Something is missing. You're just getting through another week, making another paycheck, fending off the debt, and that's it. And you're like a a hamster on a wheel going, why am I even doing this? God made you for a purpose, and our church is, God's vision for our church is that we help people find what that purpose is, and then equip you for it. And I know, I've grieved so many times because there's so many people in this time frame that can't serve. And I hate that, I hate the way we've kind of had to crimp everything, but you know what, on the other hand, several teams in our church have grown and grown and grown and grown, like our video team. You see people creeping around in the dark with black clothes on, you know, (laughs) shooting stuff. And and our whole uh, tech team has grown. The first night that we came here to kind of practice and go, we don't know when we plug all this stuff in what's going to (laughs) happen. The first night uh, before we opened publicly for Sunday morning service, there were 40 people in this building working no ushers, no greeters, none of that. Just people that we needed to make an online service work, 40 people. And so although we've had to pull back in some ways, and, and some people who could serve aren't available to serve right now. And we understand that. Life's different. It's difficult. But on the other hand, we have been able to help other people find their purpose. Number three, living the belief that anyone can find Jesus. So listen, during this time, we've uh, had an outreach to middle school teachers. Uh, to, to, we had a food drive for foster families. We did family drive-ins. We've done a lot of local ministry. On top of that, as we've been talking, we've done a, a lot digitally. So we made a huge investment in lighting and stuff I don't even know how to pronounce and stuff I don't understand so that we can improve what, those of you who are watching this morning online, we, we're doing that so that we can improve what you're seeing. And by the way, did you know this? Every Sunday, there are more people worshiping with us online than in this room. And that's been true every Sunday since COVID hit. Every time. Our online church is bigger than our in-person church and has been significantly larger. And, and so let me give you an example of that. So we've, we've been doing the renovations and all of this to make that happen. But let me tell you the impact. People have worshipped with us from 22 states in America and 64 countries in the world. Is that awesome? I think that's awesome. And so, why? Because God gave us a vision to live the belief that anyone can find Him. Anyone. And so we've got to continue to speak to people where they are. By the way, this week... We're going to start a major renovation project. We're, we're renovating a permanent studio. So never, ever again, we're going to have something like COVID, and it's going to shut us down. When you don't go back to March you know, 20-something and watch our first service, when you don't do that, please don't do that. We're never going to be put in a place where we have to do that again. Because we're making a major investment to renovate a permanent studio so we can broadcast anything and everything that we need to from that space. And in March, right before COVID, we came to you on missions day and said, hey, since we believe that God wants us to live the belief that anyone can find him, we want to target the unreached people in the world. That's who we want to target. And we gave you five missionaries who we had never supported, 
who were going to places in the world that were unreached. So let me give you the places. Morocco, Peru, Cambodia, Sierra Leone, and China. And so many of you said, yes, we need to do that. And less than two weeks later, COVID-19 hit. And to be honest with you, we didn't know what was going to happen. We went, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. We've got these missionaries who have dedicated their life to go to these places. They need our support. They need to get there. What are we going to do? We didn't know what to do, and we didn't know what was going to happen. But let me tell you what we did do. You would think in COVID would be the time to back off. Let me tell you what we did. We now support all five. All five of them. You know why? Isn't that great? I think it's great. Because we believe God's called us to live the belief. And here, not only that, let me tell you what else we did. We also added three more missionary families. You met one of them a couple of weeks ago, the McDonald's who God has called to reach a nomadic, unreached tribe in the Amazon rainforest. There's there's another couple we're supporting who are called to reach the Sikh population in New York City. And next week, you're going to meet another couple who is called to the people of Laos. Eight. Not the original five, but we have already reached out to, to help eight people reach unreached people. You know why? We don't believe God said to us, it's my vision for you to say... It's not my vision for you to believe. It's my vision for you to live the belief that anyone can find Jesus. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to live it. Now, you've been through the same thing. We've all been through the same things. You've seen in the the past several months how difficult race relations have been. The, the, The tension between black people and white people in America has been really difficult. And we've all grieved on different levels, different things. Um, I, I think we, I think we've all grieved some somehow. And so, a couple of months ago, what I did is I sat down with a small group of black leaders from our church, and I said, "Now, please talk to me. Talk to me. Help me understand how to interpret what I'm watching on television. Help me to understand." The journey of the black person in America, what it feels like, what it sounds like, what you're going through. Help me to understand as a pastor how we might as a church work to heal the division between black and white people. What, what can we do? Can I tell you, it was an unbelievably rich conversation that I benefited from greatly. And I, and I appreciate it greatly. And, and, I'm, and I know we're going to be able to act on some of the things that I learned. But here, here's, here's the thing. We have to, we've been apocalypsed. The curtain has been pulled back. Therefore, we must live the belief that anyone can find Jesus. Black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, anybody and everybody can find Jesus. we got to live it. We can't talk it, we got to live it. Rich, poor, sick, old, young, anybody. And that means that we've got to remove every barrier between a person and the gospel. Racism is a barrier that separates people from Jesus, so it's got to go. Geography is a barrier that separates people from Jesus, so we got to reach digitally. It's got to go. There are people on earth, entire people groups, ethnic people groups, who don't have a church, who don't know a Christian, who've never heard the name Jesus one time. They have no access. That barrier's got to go. It's got to go. And that's the vision that God has given us. All right, one more. Number four. How are, we going to, how are we going to be a movement of hope? Empowering everyone to take their next step. So you know some of the people who've suffered the most, I think, through this whole thing are children. And t- I, kids have started school for the first time in their life in COVID. They started kindergarten and middle school and high school and graduated in college. And I, I don't, we don't even know yet the impact that's going to have on them as a generation. But for decades, we are going to be looking back, and this will be the COVID generation or whatever. It's having an impact. We don't know how much, but it is. And so what we've done as a church is said, one of the disruptions that 
younger people have felt if they, they've lost some of their momentum spiritually because they were progressing and moving. And now they're out of community and things are kind of out of whack. So we have worked to add children's ministry back as quickly as we could. And so we have kids ministry this morning. This, uh, next month, youth ministry, Epic on Wednesday night, is going to open uh, for some select dates. Because we have to learn as we go. And then our 20s ministry started, we've had two 20s life, we have one more this year. So we're doing what we can do to live the vision that God's given us. And groups, life groups, have continued online. Some have met sporadically in person. And if you don't have a group, I highly recommend that disconnection with community is very um, damaging to our faith. And so, so next week, or in a couple of weeks, we're going to open a, a, a welcome center in the foyer. You notice we're kind of redecorating there. Because we've had so many new people visit our church in the last three or four months. Every week, every week, every week. And what we want to say to you as a new person to our church, what is your next step? Like God's call on our life is to help you take your next step, whatever it is. And so we're going to open a space there so that we can greet you after service for a moment. Just get, get to introduce ourselves and help you figure out what the next step is. Everybody has another step. And our church is called to help you find it and take it. Everything we do at Kingwood Church is an overflow of our vision because God has apocalypsed us. He pulled the curtain back and said, this is what I want you to be. When I look at Kingwood from heaven, this is what God sees. And we're not that yet. But man, we're, we're headed that way. And that's what we want to be. Because we believe that's what God wants us to be. Hey, I wonder uh, about you this morning. I don't think it matters so much. You know, people say... Oh, I had a dream. You know, God spoke to me in a dream. I don't think it really matters so much how God speaks to you as much as it matters what he says. So it could be a dream. It could be a Bible verse. It could be a friend. It could be a sermon. It could be a worship service. It could be a moment just like this when God just says, I'm trying to, I'm trying to lead you. I'm trying to guide you. I'm trying to show you something. I love you. And I'm trying to pull you close. I don't think it matters how he does it. I just think it matters that we notice and we see it and we respond to it is there something God's trying to show you is there something he's trying to say to you is there something he wants you to know right now that you don't know yet is there a part of himself he's trying to reveal to you wonder maybe you're facing a challenge you're kind of like that servant who looked out the window and said, oh no, <laughs> oh no, not this, not this, not now, now's the worst time. I wonder if you're facing a challenge and it just looks like the circumstances that are against you are worse than the resources you have to fend it off, to meet it, to overcome it. Maybe you look out the window and you're just looking at earth and you say, God, I, I don't know how I'm going to I'm discouraged, I'm overwhelmed, I'm tired. Mental health has struggled in this time dramatically. Discouragement, depression, job loss, marriage problems, family problems, work problems. People are hurting. You know, I feel like that guy sometimes who Jesus was talking to him and he said, Jesus said, do you believe? I don't even know how to take that when Jesus asked you, do you believe? You're like, I'm supposed to say yes. You know, I don't know can't imagine Jesus physically coming to you in person saying, do you believe? Yes, yes, I believe. You know, just lie, whatever you got to do. I can't tell Jesus I don't believe. But the guy was honest. And he said, I do believe, but forgive my unbelief. Like I'm trying to believe, but I'm struggling. You ever feel like that? I Man, I do sometimes. My, my wife continues to fight this little disease that's just overwhelmed her body. This morning when she was brushing her teeth, I was holding her steady so she wouldn't fall down while she's brushing her teeth. I said, God, let me see more than earth. God, let me just see more than earth. Because it looks like the army around me is greater than the army inside me right now. 
she's trying to brush her hair. She can hardly hold a brush anymore. She sort of snagged it through there, and she said, does it look good? And I thought, oh, not really. <laughs> not really. It doesn't really look good. Come here, let me try to. And you could tell I'm not so good at it. Still doesn't look that good, but I tried. Listen. When we talk about apocalypse, when we talk about dreams, we're not talking about some weird thing out there in the cosmos with people who don't live real life. I live real life, and it hurts. And I'm telling you, when God opens a curtain, he's not trying to impress you. He's trying to love you. He's just opening a window and saying, I'm for you, and I'm not against you. And I just wonder this morning, how many of you, would you just stand with me? I wonder how many of you might be saying, you know what? It just looks like the army that's around me. I'm just looking at this battle. I'm looking at this fight. I'm looking at this circumstance. And it looks like I'm losing, and I'm going to lose, and I can't win. That's what it looks like. Would you just close your eyes for a moment and open your heart? If you're online, just kind of pause where you are. And just kind of settle with us for a minute. Today, if you say, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. (laughs) Even when it doesn't look like it, even when it doesn't feel like it, even when it doesn't sound like it. I feel like some days I'm the servant looking out the window and I've said, have you seen the army? And I believe that's when God gently comes beside us and says, I've seen both armies (laughs) and mine's bigger. With your eyes closed, today if you say, you know what, I need prayer. I need God. I need God to meet me in this moment. I need encouragement. I need to win this battle I'm fighting. I need to get through. I need to overcome. I need to be set free. I need a touch from God today. Just lift your hand. With every eye closed, just lift your hand and say, I need it today. I need it today. Yeah, 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 yeah. My gosh. Just all throughout the room, really. I'm telling you, God has come today to apocalypse you. He's come to pull a curtain back. It doesn't matter if it's a dream or a song or whatever. If you're online and you say, I I need prayer, just drop that in the comment section. Say, I need prayer. Our prayer team is live. They're waiting for you. They've been praying all morning for this moment. If you haven't, just put, maybe you want to put the need, pray for this or that. Those of you who lifted your hands, come on, let's pray together this morning. God, I thank you today that you're present with us. And a dream that you have sent just reminds us that you're present with us, that this earth is not all that there is. There is a God with an army who's greater than any army of the world. There's a God with the resources of heaven who stands amongst us this morning and who is moving. Come on, if you need him, just reach out and say, God, I need you today. God, touch me today. Help me see heaven and not just earth. Help me to see the angels that have been sent. Help me to see the strength that you've given. Help me to see the grace. Help me to see your power at work. God, I need you today. God, come in your power and grace and touch this morning. I pray you would turn circumstances. I pray you would heal marriages. Come on and pray with me. I pray that you would open jobs. I pray you would open doors. I pray you would open provision. I pray you would heal bodies. Come on and ask him. God, I pray you would do it today. Shift, shift this thing. Shift this room. God, move in this room. Do what only you can do now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And our worship team's coming to sing a song called Tremble that just talks about how in the light of God, all the dark shadows of the world leave. Would you just for a moment say, God, I recognize you as the light of the world. God, make every shadow and every circumstance tremble and fall. Come on and let's all sing it together this morning.